Greetings, my brothers and sisters, and welcome to uh, our Lady of Fatima parent uh, formation classes. My name is Ricardo Chapa, and I will be your instructor, teacher, I, I prefer to call myself your guide. Now, uh, most people call me Rico, and in particular, my name is really Tio Rico. Everybody says, ah, Tio Rico, Tio Rico. So if somebody asks you who was your instructor, your guide, through these uh, sessions, tell them Tio Rico was my teacher. Uh, we're trying something new in this, the age of COVID, the terrible time when we have to practice remote distancing. We're going to have this session remote. It used to be live. Uh, I used to speak in front of all of you, the parents. Uh, so this time we're going to try it remote. Let's just see what happens. It's a very new experience. Brave new world for us in the time of COVID. Uh, two things I would like to explain to you as we begin the sessions. Uh, I'm recording this in my house. And number one, I have dogs. And I've tried to keep them uh, quiet and uh, manage that situation. But if in the middle of the session you hear a lot of barking, uh, please bear with me. Uh, they'll quiet down in a second. The other thing is kind of personal. Um, not that long ago, I, I suffered a, a great loss, a loss of my wife. And as I'm doing this session or one of the other sessions, I may break down. Uh, I may get kind of emotional. Just bear with me and uh, I'll recover and just you know, so you can understand what's going on. It has nothing to do with you, of course. And um, just, just, just wait a second, give me a time to compose and I'll proceed. But just so you'll know, just in case that ever happens. So these are the remote sessions. And today's lesson, lesson one, is God's love. Before we start, I mean, I just want to lay the base, you know. Why do you have to do these classes? I mean, it, Irma required it. It's something you have to do. We force you to do it. I, I would hope that you would get past that kind of an attitude. What we are doing here is something for you, for your good. I mean, you've done a wonderful job. You've, you've made great sacrifices to bring your kids or to enroll your kids in religious education so that they can be prepared for their sacraments. This is for you. But what we do in these classes is, is to help you understand what's going to happen to your, your children, what is going to be their experience as they uh, enter into the sacramental life of our church. But at the same time, all of us have gone through the sacraments. What happened many years ago when you too experienced these sacraments for the first time and continue to experience them, except for baptism, of course? This classes, these classes are to help you deepen your faith, help you grow in your relationship with your God. So it's for your own growth. This is for you. You've done a wonderful job for your kids. You have great teachers that are taking care of your kids. This is for you. The theme for today, I've already mentioned, is God's love. As a matter of fact, God is love. That three-letter word, God, translates to a four-letter word, love. So let's begin with a prayer. Uh, all of you there watching right now, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. When we have signed ourselves, we've made the mark of love. We'll come that, back to that point in a second. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for, for, for this opportunity to learn a little bit about our kids and what they're going to have to experience and, and ourselves and what we have experienced and especially today, this, this beautiful theme, love, how much you love us. Help us to truly understand that. And to be grateful for your love and through that love all the many gifts that you grant to us and our families. And before we end the prayer, let me read you a little bit from scripture. And this is love. You need to know what love is. Because we're going to talk about the very, very definition of love. And it's not that we love God. It's that he loved us. And he sent his son to be in atonement for our sins. He loved us. So let's begin. And we end our prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We proceed. When you love. Several things happen. The first thing is 
You don't just love somebody from afar. Oh, I love that person way over there. If you love someone that's over there, you want to be with that person. You want to interact with that person. You want to enter into a relationship with that person. I always tell my students, and let's see if you can, let's see, if you can see this. These classes are R-rated. If they're asking what's the rating for these classes, they are R-rated. Not for R, for sexuality, from language, although sometimes I do slip. Uh, occasionally the words come out, sorry. But for the word relationship. Love is about wanting to form a relationship and be with the lover, the loved one. Part of this entering into relationship is a giving of gifts. So when you love somebody, honey, you remember the long time ago when we used to court each other as uh, husband and wife? <laughs> we would bring gifts, bring gifts to our loved one. Well, the same thing. God is, is the same way. He loves you. From the very beginning of time, he already knew who you were, he called you by name, loved you, and then wanted to shower you with many, many, many gifts. But I'm going to talk about three, three of the most important gifts that he gives you. Gift number one, first gift that God gives you. Just do this. You're breathing. You're alive. Life is the very first gift that God gives you. He formed you in his mind since the beginning of time. But at a set point in time, 1950 for me, he decided it's time to make the Tio Rico that I've always loved. Same thing with me. At some point in time, we call it a birthday. Actually, it's the point of conception. At that time, he gave you the gift of life. Why does he give you life? He gives you life so that he can now uh uh to you. What is that? He gives you life so that he can now love you. And you can experience that love in its fullness. This one particular class is so you can understand how much you are loved. And then the third gift is kind of interesting, something you wouldn't expect in a talk on love. He gives you the gift of freedom. We'll come back to that in a while, about 20, 25 minutes. This is a long session, so be comfortable. You can always pause it and come back to it. But we will eventually explain what freedom has to do with the topic of love. God is love. God loves you. And this session is for you to understand how much you are loved. We start with a love story. We start at the very beginning. God enters into a love relationship with his people. If any of you have ever played chess, somebody's got to start chess. It's the white. Oh, white makes the first move. God is the white. He makes the first move. With the black, there's always a little bit of darkness in our lives. We respond to his move. He makes the first move. And that's just what I just read you. God loved us first. And then we experience that love and hopefully we return that love. Where does this story begin, this love story? Well, it begins in a garden. In a garden. In the garden of two people, our first parents, Adam and Eve. He creates a garden, he puts Adam and Eve into that, and from that, he begins this love relationship. He has made the first move. And it starts in the garden. What happens? Everything is wonderful. It is a paradise. But it falls apart. Obvious question. Who screwed up? Not God. We did. And don't blame Adam and Eve. We did. All of us as humans. We screwed it up and lost paradise. We screwed it up and lost this connection with God's love. We screwed it up and rejected his love. Happens in relationships. I'm sure you've had experience. 
experience relationships in which somehow they broke apart. Somehow somebody dissolved that relationship. We did. We did. What is love? Love is something that never gives up. Despite this rejection, God never gives up on them and on us. So we'll talk about that. From here on in, this love story that I'm mentioning continues, but it continues first with a people, what we call the Jews, the Hebrews. He forms a relationship with the Hebrews, and through the Hebrews, he expands this love contract with them. And from this relationship with the Hebrews, he will come on to love the rest of us. Your experience of God's love came first from his experience of Adam and Eve, and then his experience with loving the Jewish people. So many of you are familiar with these stories. There's uh, Noah and the great flood and the, the rainbow. Here's Moses with the Ten Commandments. I got the Ten Commandments here, so I can have a the Ten Commandments. He parts the sea, goes like that, and all of a sudden the part the sea is parted. You're also probably familiar with the story of David and Goliath with the little sling he kills the, the giant. All of these stories uh, I'm sure you've heard in your childhood. I hope you were sharing them with your children as well. This is the story of something that we have a fancy name for it. It's called Salvation History. It's a love story of God's relationship with the Jewish people first. First. Okay, just a second ago I said, who screwed up the relationship? Who rejected this love? And said, I don't need this. <clears throat> Adam and Eve. What did the Jews do as God relates to them and expresses his love for them? The same thing. It's what we call this stuff. All of us. We reject that love. It's so good, we can't take it. And we reject it. They reject it. They reject this love. They reject this offer of a relationship. And God, who is so desperate to enter into this relationship with his love, these loved ones never, ever gives up. Constantly, they reject him, he comes back to them. They reject him, he comes back to them. It's a story that repeats over and over. He is madly in love with all of us, really, all of us. And then this love story culminates with Jesus. We just celebrated that in Christmas time. All of a sudden, not only does he love us, but he decides to become one of us. I, Father Liam was the one who really used to express this. I, I love the way he would say, you know, think of a little ant down there. And he would go like that. Instead of stepping on the ant, God decides to become the ant and experience what it's like to be an ant and to look at a big shoe coming at you from afar. He comes here to experience everything that you experience. All the joys, yes, but all the pains, all the sorrows, what it means to be sick, what it means to have a headache, what it means to be heartbroken, like me, to experience that pain. He comes to heal. He kneels down to wash people's feet. He cries. I cry a lot nowadays. That's an expression of love. He cries, and yes, he gets angry. He gets darn mad. Anger. Those of you that are in a marriage relationship is very much a part of your love relationship with your spouse. Shouldn't be the major part, but anger has its place in a love relationship and in a marriage. I used to teach marriage classes. I, I talk about anger say, it's good, it just needs to be constructive and not destructive. There is a difference. All of these things that the Son does, Jesus Christ, our Lord, are the culmination of God's love for us. So I have a time out here right now. Time out. Okay, let's stop this story about love and have a little time out and we're going to change the subject. And what we're going to talk about is what is love itself? We've been talking, God loves you, God loves you, whatever, whatever. Truly, what is love? So let's talk about that for a few minutes. What is love?
I, as I explained, used to teach marriage preparation classes. I would help the couples get ready to prepare for marriage. And one of the things I would do is very simple at the very beginning, you know, all you two are going to get married. Oh, yeah, we're going to get married. And then I say, okay, why do you want to get married with her? Why do you want to get married with him? They didn't realize, the question I'm already asking is, what is the nature of your love for this other person that you want to get married to? Here's the response I would always get. I love this person because she makes me laugh. Ah, he's so cute, he's always telling jokes. He makes me smile. Every time I look at her, I smile. For guys especially, not always, but for guys especially, uh, She's hot. She's beautiful. Wow, baby. You know, they, they, there was an attraction to the physical beauty of, of the partner. And they would express that. They would express that. In general, the idea is, I love this person. I want to get married to this person because this person makes me feel good. So there it is. Makes me feel good. What's wrong with this picture? Look at the finger. This is all about me. And this person that I love, that I marry, exists. And I want to be in this marriage relationship so that I can feel good. It's all about me. That's not love. True love, real love, is that you care so much for the other. You want to enter in this relationship. I want to get married to my spouse so that I can make that person happy. Not me. The object, the reason why I'm married is so that I can make that person happy. I had hundreds of couples. Only one time did I have a young lady say, I want to get married to him so that I can make him happy one time. Real, real love. And all you want is what's best for the other person. So we get rid of this, and that's love. What you are doing for your spouse, she's no longer beautiful, she's no longer hot. As a matter of fact, she can't even feed herself. I want to give to her. I get emotional because in the last few weeks of my wife's life, I ended up doing exactly that, feeding her, feeding her, that's love. Of giving herself to the other. Of wanting herself to make the other person happy instead of this. Human law, love can be so flawed because we base it on the self. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. I'm sorry, but, and you experience that. You see that a lot in television, in movies, in the shows that you watch. This is love. It isn't. The minute you see love as what I can get out of it, you know it's not the real thing. Self-centered. It's really a want. You really shouldn't say, I love you. If, if that's your attitude, I want you. I want you to make me happy. I want, you to, I want your body. I want your security. I want your money. I want the prestige of your family so I can get married to you and I can be prestigious. I want things from you. I'm in want with you. It's not love. It's not love. And there's conditions. Okay, honey, if you do this for me, then I'll love you. But you gotta do this for me first. Then I'll respond. That just is a disaster. And here's how it ends up. In brokenness. Ask yourself, how many of you have ever been in the past in a relationship that seemed so good at the beginning? Yeah, right. And ended up because it was flawed. It was based on want. God doesn't love that way. 
don't think of God as a superhuman and he does what human people do, but in a better way. God is God. Don't compare him to us. There is no flaw in God. There is no flaw in his love. God's love is pure. There is no I want you because you can do this for me. I just love you. What God says to you. God's love is absolute. By that I mean there isn't, I will give you this much love, but there's still a little bit reserved. Uh, good example. God loves the Pope because the Pope is so holy much more than he loves you because you're not as holy as the Pope. No. no. There is nothing you can do. It works both ways to increase God's love for you. I mean, you can say rosaries all the time and go to Mass every day and you walk little old ladies across the street, you do all these good deeds. God's not going to love you more than he does right now if you do all these good things. And it works the other way too. There is nothing you can do to lose God's love. I'm serious. Sin is not something, I, unfortunately, we're not going to have to class on sin, but sin is not something that will make God stop, you from, stop him from loving you. You can get the greatest sin in the world. It doesn't matter. He will still love you. His love is unconditional. Listen to this. Your salvation is unconditional. When you die, whether you're going to go that way, well, this way depends on you and how you respond to God's love. At that point is your choice. But his love will always be there. And he's going to love you as is. Gordo, flaco, ugly like me, beautiful, smart, dumb. No matter what you are and how you are, no matter what human defects that everybody else laughs at you, God will not. As is absolute, complete, and total love for you. So you can't earn it, like I said, and you can't lose it. He already loves you to the absolute, to the max. Just loves you. Okay, Teorico, well, uh, what makes you such an expert? I mean, uh, why do I say that I know what God's love is? Has he ever told me? Actually, he has. Actually, he has. There's three ways that we can experience... Oh, where's my Bible? Oh, whatever. Doesn't matter. You know, take my word for it. There's three ways that God loves you and the way we, we kind of experience his love. First of all, life. The sheer fact that you're alive is a proof of God's love for you. God loves, looks on you and loves you. If he were ever to take his eyes away from you and not look at you and not give you that love, he would die in an instant. You exist constantly, every second of your life, because of experiencing God's love. That's what this one proof. And then there's the Bible. Like I say, I had my Bible here and then somebody borrowed it. That's good, they needed it. The Bible is full, it's a love letter. It's a love letter. It, I do have this, this sheet. Page after page after page of I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. When you were younger, did you ever write a love letter to your honey? Or I guess nowadays it's an it's a email or a text you know, expressing your love to your honey. Let me read you just, you know, there's just hundreds of passages. I'll read you five. You may not know me, but I know everything about Even the very hairs on your head are numbered. I counted every hair on your head. I know you so much. I know everything about you. I chose you when I planned creation. He was about to create the universe, and you were already in his mind. You're not a mistake. How many people, I know some few people have said, my parents told me I'm a mistake. They didn't really want me. God says, you are not a mistake. You're 
all your days are written. And here's my favorite from Isaiah. Don't be afraid. I have called you by name. The name Teorigo existed at the beginning of creation. You know why? I am the Lord your God. You are precious in my eyes. This is what he's saying. And I love you. Right there in scripture. I love you. Give me a second. And then, you know, words, words, words. I mean, yeah, you read the Bible. I love you, I love you, I love you. It's all over. Words are cheap. Words are cheap. And, and again, I ask you, have you ever been in a relationship where somebody says, I will never leave you. I will always love you. I will always be there at your side. And then, somehow, you weren't good enough for that person. I've, I've had that experience uh, several times before I met the love of my life, my wife. I know what that's like. Words, words, words. Oh, yes, I'll always be there for you. It's easy to say. I say that to Amber, you know, I love you. Words are easy. Show me love. Prove it in action. There it is. He had to do this. He didn't. He was born on Christmas Day. He was born so that he could die. The plan was already there to be born so that he could die. Remember we talked about Adam and Eve? Most of you are familiar with the story of the apple, right? And there was a tree that had an apple. Did you know, and most people don't know this, when they read the story of Adam and Eve and creation, oh, let me read it to you. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. And there he put the man and the woman whom he had formed. Right? Adam and Eve in the garden. Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree. He put a bunch of trees in that garden. That was pleasant to the sight and good for food. And there were two trees in particular. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The apple, two trees. In the middle of the garden. The apple came from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But from the beginning of time, God knew we would betray him. He planted in the garden the tree of life. He knew what we would do. And he already had a plan for the power of salvation. You know, wherever you are, your living room watching this video. I have a suggestion to humor me. Close your eyes. And imagine that, I guess there are a bunch of people in your house. Imagine that they're gone. There is nobody in your house. It's empty. Next time, next time, imagine that, oh, you know, there's nobody in Tucson. All of a sudden, poof, Tucson's empty. Go beyond that. Nobody here at all in the world. You are sitting there in your living room or wherever you are, your sofa, your chair, and you're the only person that exists. Only person, one person. Open your eyes. If you were the only person that ever existed in all of creation, he would still Climb on that cross for you. Because you're worth it. Because he loves you that much. He didn't climb on the cross. I will do this for this group of people. I love them all. I love you as is individually. One to one. And if you're the only person, I will do this. This is the proof. So it gives you some idea of what love is. How much he loves you. Yeah, yeah, Rico, and I 
nice class, right? How, how much time more is left in this session? Uh, yeah, God, but yeah, yeah. And I don't really buy that. What's stopping you? What's stopping you from believing? Not what I say, what God is saying. What's stopping you from accepting what you love me? Experience you. Can you believe this? That much? No. No, we don't. We're humans. We're human. Uh, maybe I had a bad experience. We've been talking about broken relationships. Uh, especially if you had a bad experience with your father. Because we think of God as a father figure. I can see that. My father used to uh, beat me up. My father used to sexually abuse me. Whatever. And so I don't think of fathers as very heroic in my viewpoint. God as a father? One more. That could be a problem. It, it, just think about that. If, if you have a pure, poor image of, of father, fatherhood, it, it might be hard to experience God as the father that loved you so much. But most people, their problem with experiencing love is this. I don't deserve it. You know, the Pope does. He's holy. But, you know, you don't know what I've done. Uh, I have a friend. He's dying. He's dying. Work with hospice, I work with the dying. And he tells me, Rico, the things that I've done in the past, I don't know if God will ever forgive me. And so we talk about forgiveness, we talk about forgiveness. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. I, I, I put this image in front of you. Uh, sometimes it's hard to see, so I'll, I'll just express it. Okay, so there's Jesus holding on to this guy. But you need to know what's in his hands. So I have it here. So he, in his hand, he's got the mallet, and in this hand, he has the nail. And what he had been doing was driving the nail on Jesus' hand. As a matter of fact, you can't see it, but the wound is right there. That's what he did. And this is embrace is how Jesus reacts to what he did. There's nothing you have ever done that God's love But it is about, I am not worthy. I don't deserve this. You don't know the things I've done in the past. You don't know the things that Tio Rico has done in the past. God loves you. Last one, and then we're going to switch. We're not over. We're about halfway. Well, you know, I got a question for you, and it's a good question. If God loves us so much, as we as a people, uh, how come there's so much suffering? How can this God that loves us allow the COVID, all that suffering that we've experienced with the, with the virus, how can he allow my wife die of cancer? How can he allow cancer to roam through the world? It actually is like the number one killer. COVID's number three. Why is there so much pain out there? What happened? Didn't you say you love us? It's a good question. It's valid. You can ask that. First thing is, way back then in the garden, remember the garden, that, that's a key point. It was never God's plan that we suffer. The garden is a good example of God's initial plan for eternal joy. We talked about it. Guess who screwed up? We rejected that love. Not Adam and Eve. We. And I know how many times in my past I have rejected that love. Search yourselves. Yes, you'll probably find moments of darkness. And from that rejection in the garden came pain, even things like natural disasters and hurricanes and landslides and COVID viruses, all that thing came from the fact that we initiated brokenness into the paradise that was so initially intended for us. It was never his plan. Never his 
Why is there so much suffering? Part of it's because of freedom. I have a picture of the robot. God could have created us as robots, pre-programmers, and then we would say, I love you, I love you. He could have forced us to love him. But he didn't. Remember what I said. One of the great gifts that God gives you is freedom. You are free to love. And I know this is stupid, but this is the kind of things that I do. I took my Alexa. And uh, so think of Alexa, like a robot. And I took my Alexa and I said, Alexa, yeah. Alexa, do you love me? And <laughs> I did, I did. And, and Alexa responded, Oh, I like you a lot as a friend. Okay, we'll go from there. Alexa, yes. What does it mean to be a friend? She didn't know how to answer that question. This is a robot. This is a machine. That's a robot. That's a machine. There is no way this thing can love me. It can obey me and tell me what time it is, tell me the temperature, answer most any question that I ask, because it has no freedom. It exists only to do its program as I desire it to answer my questions. A robot can never love. God gave us freedom so that we could be free to love him or not. Think about it. It was actually a risky thing to create us that way. He could have created us as robots. I love you, do, 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 do. Instead, he gave you the choice to love him or not. Freedom is very important. Suffering in itself. can come with good. I'm not saying is good, but it can result in good. God can bring good out of suffering. So this is the tomb. First came the cross. First, the incredible act of love. I'll die. I'll experience this so that you can experience life. But he experiences the resurrection. It is both the cross and the resurrection. And the reason I have this picture in particular is if you read the Gospel of John, John makes a big deal of pointing out, of pointing out that the tomb was right next to a garden. All the brokenness in our life started in a garden. God fixes that brokenness by the empty tomb next to a garden. It's a symbol of how God can take suffering and produce good for it. This may be for you an unusual concept, but if you are in pain, if you suffer, you can ask God to take your suffering and use it to help someone else. From the cross, in the middle of this much pain, some of you, you can ask, share my pain as I do this for everybody. Your pain can be used to help someone else. It's a difficult theological concept that I presented to you. God can take your suffering for the good of others if you allow. If you touch the cross and say, yeah, I accept. Take my pain to help my tia, to help my son, to help my friend. That's all I can say about suffering. We're talking about Love leads to relationship. I, I'm constantly 
harping on this R word. It's R-rated relationship. But there are many kinds of relationships. And, and the question is, what is the nature of this relationship that God wants to enter into you? And understanding that, you'll understand a little bit more about his love for you. Uh, so the fancy word, the, the relationship that God wants to enter into with you, is a covenant. It's a covenant. There are different kinds of relationship, but the one God wants to enter into with you. This loving relationship is a covenant relationship. And you might, uh, I, you know, I'll tell you right away, uh, I used to teach marriage classes. Marriage itself is one example of a covenant relationship. So it's a good one to pattern yourself after to understand. So we'll start with contract. Many people, when they say uh, covenant, they're saying, I make a covenant with you. They say, I, I make an agreement with you, and it's a contract. It's a, it's a contractual agreement. Th this is one nature of, of a relationship, but it's not a covenant. When you do a contract, what you are putting in this contract is the minimum. As long as I do one, two, three, one, these seven things, and I sign my name, I'm good to the contract. And if you do these other seven things, and you do what you want to do with me, to me, and you sign your name, you and I have fulfilled the contract. We signed it. I agreed to do these seven things. You agreed to do these other seven things. We're good. It's great. It's a contract. Yes. And that is an agreement. And that is a relationship. But it's not a covenant. The thing about a contract, it's the minimum. This is the least. As long as I do that, we're in a contract. Let, let me give you an example of that. Uh, I remember a long time ago, I, I went up to my son, Javier, and I said, son, your, your shirt's dirty. Go take it to your room. Put it away. So, my son goes to the door of his room. He opens the door. He walks up through the very threshold of his room, takes the dirty shirt, and drops it right there at the very threshold. He fulfilled the minimum amount of the contract. I said, take the shirt to your room. He did it. He did it. Word for word, everything that I requested. That's what he did. The minimum. And the other problem with contracts is, you know what? Siempre no. I changed my mind. Uh, yeah, forget it. It was a bad idea. You think it's a bad idea? Okay, good. We terminate that. Or even if you don't think it's a bad idea, I do. It's gone. It's torn. Contracts can be terminated. Not a covenant. A covenant is not a contract. First of all, whereas a contract is a minimum, as long as you do these seven things, you're good. You've done it. A covenant is the maximum. And that's what a marriage is. I love you. And I exist in my life here on in, within this marriage, is to do everything within my power to make you happy. Not the least amount to make you happy. Everything of my being is to please you and make your life, make your life joyful. I exist for your needs and not for my wants. And whatever it is you need, I will do whatever I can to fulfill it to the maximum. That's a marriage covenant. Covenant is the maximum. And the other thing about a covenant, you never tarry. You never, ever, ever tarry. It is permanent. Our marriage is forever. Until then. Until then. <laughs> to help you understand a little bit about covenant, uh, let me just give you an example of, of how you enter into a covenant. And I'll tell you right away, it has to do with blood. It has to do with blood. So it's a profound relationship that, that is sealed with blood. So I'm going to read to you a very unusual passage from the scripture, from the Old Testament. And for the longest time, I never understood this. I would read it and say, yeah, interesting, but psh, 
what, what is this about? So this is God making a covenant with Abraham. And this is how God seals this covenant relationship, kind of similar to signing the contract, but it's different. Look how he does it. God says to Abraham, bring me a three-year-old heifer, which is a cow, a bull, a three-year-old sheep goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abraham got all these things, and he split them in two and placed each half opposite the other. So what Abraham did is he took the calf, and he would take a knife and cut it lengthwise, lengthwise, until there were two pieces of the animal. And he put one piece on one side and the other piece on the other side. And he did that for several animals. And he laid the pieces of half animals, one on each side and the other half on the other side. You can just imagine what it was like. There was blood all over, urine, you know, all, all sorts of stuff, guts spilling. It smelled horrible. It was a terrible sight. So then when the sun had set and it was dark, there appeared a smoking brazier, which would be this thing. In the old days, you'd put charcoal in there. You'd put this in your room, and that's what kept your house warm, or your room warm anyway. A smoking brazier and a flaming torch, and a flaming torch, which passed between these pieces. And it was on that occasion that the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. You know, in, in, in modern times, if, if you want to make an agreement with two people, a king has been fighting with another king, and they want to make peace, they do, uh, you know, what we do. They, 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 they sign a contract and say, for now on, that there be peace between us. But in the old days, in the old days, when two kings wanted to enter into an agreement and settle their conflict and enter into a binding, loving relationship, they would do something similar. They would take an animal and cut it in half. And again, imagine all the blood, the, the urine, the guts. It was a mess. And then, the two halves of the animal right there, they would cross. Imagine what your feet are like. They're full of blood and guts and that guy, no, whatever. But they would walk between it. One king first, and then the other king followed second. And, and you would say, well, what, what's the point of doing that? As they were crossing between the two, the king would swear, this is my contract, my covenant contract with this other person. And if I ever violate that contract, if I ever break that covenant, may they take me and split me in two. There's one piece of the animal, there's the other piece of the animal, and there's all that blood and guts and yucky stuff in between. They would walk in between and promise I will do this. I will do this forever. And if I ever fail this relationship, may they cut me in half as well. That's how serious and that's how permanent a covenant is. But here's the interesting question that I ask of you. I'll give you a couple seconds to think about it. Have you ever seen anything like this? I mean, maybe in a movie. I, I, I don't think so, but this is probably the first time you ever heard about this. Have you ever seen anything like this where you split it in two? And the answer is often. Often. During the celebration of the Eucharist, and we'll talk about the Eucharist and sessions to be. The priest takes the lamb. It's not bread, it's a person. At that point, it is a person. And we'll talk about that. 
It's a real person. And if you notice what the priest does, he cuts it in half and says, this is the Lamb of God. And then he does something even more amazing. Okay, so there's that one, right? He cuts it in half. And then he does this. He takes the chalice, which has wine, wine, vino. Yeah, te pone borracho. It has wine in it. And then he says, and we'll talk about this in the next few sessions. This isn't blood. Excuse me, this isn't wine. It is blood of the lamb. The blood of the lamb. And listen to his words. Because you see this at every mass. You hear this at every Take this, all of you, and drink from it. You're asked to drink from this blood. For this is the chalice of his blood. And the words here of my blood. And listen to this. The blood of the new and eternal At every Mass, you literally recreate that experience of the covenant sealing the parting of the Lamb into two pieces. You actually have seen this every time you go to Mass. That gives you a lot to think about, huh? Does God really love me? Do I believe Tio Rico or I've turned the TV off a long time ago with the computer and I'm just now watching something else? I don't want to do it. And, and if I'm loved, how do I return this love? And this covenant thing, I mean, that kind of got a little bit heavy there. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this means for me. Okay. So I'll set you up for the future. This is the end. I'm at the very end. This covenant, this relationship, th this love that Rico has talked about, Tio Rico has talked about, maybe I do buy that. M maybe I do understand that, or maybe I want to understand it. Uh, I want to believe that God loves me that much. How do I enter into this relationship? Enter? And how do I grow? Uh, when two people fall in love, they, they grow more and more and more and more into love. How does this, this love relationship grow? And, and uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, through scripture, through God's love letter, through prayer, and through sacraments. Sacraments are what you are all about. Sacraments are why you brought your kids to religious ed so that they could participate in the sacraments. In the past, in other days, I would have another session on scripture. I would have another session on prayer. These the time of COVID. We're just going to have to make uh, the best we can. I will only deal with sacraments. But realize it's part of three things that help you into this love relationship with your creator. So next session, session two, will be... What is a sacrament and what does this have to do with my relationship with my God? So remember, for this one, it's session one and session one B. Um, think about it. Think about it and, and, and realize the greatest love in your life is not your, your husband or your wife. It's not your children. It's not your favorite football team. Nothing like that. The greatest love in your life is your creator who created you. You are the creature. And he created you. He made you for one purpose only. So that you could experience that much love. So let us end with a prayer. This the signing of the cross is the act of love. Okay? So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we just symbolize our love. So Heavenly Father, 
signing ourselves with the greatest example of love ever in history. We ask you to help us to understand what is the nature of this love relationship that you've called us to. Help us to truly believe and want and respond to this love. Help us with whatever is hindering us from experiencing the love, understanding what this love means. And lead us towards relationship so that our lives can take on true meaning. So that we can understand we were born to experience love. That is, is the purpose of our life. Help us to really grasp that concept and live it. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who was born for us, so that he could die for us. God love you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters.